Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sangeeta Chaudhary once again. I welcome everybody to this live session. Uh, this is uh, going to be uh, my fourth live session where I'm going to talk about two more important topics from cardiovascular. So uh, basically today I'm going to talk about heart failure and then I'm going to talk about rheumatic fever. So let's begin with heart failure. We all have heard the terminology heart failure. Heart failure can be chronic or it can be acute. Heart failure, it can be chronic or it can be acute heart failure. For acute heart failure, there is something known as ADHF. ADHF stands for acute decompensated heart failure. This is a life-threatening emergency. You really need to know how to manage a patient heart failure, especially when a patient comes with acute decompensation of heart failures. So let's begin with the definition of heart failure. What is heart failure actually? Just to begin with, previously heart failure was known as CHF, stands for congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure. But these days, the term Congestive heart failure has been obsolete because many of the patients do not have any congestive symptom. So, if there is no congestive symptom, no point of calling it as congestive heart failure. So, now it is known as only heart failure. What is heart failure? As per the AC, AHA and ACCF guideline, that is American College of Cardiology Foundation and American Heart Association, AHS. American Heart Association. Whenever actually we talk about cardiovascular diseases, hypertension and all, we tend to follow the guideline of American Heart Association or American College of Cardiology Foundation. So what is it? What is heart failure? Heart failure is basically a complex syndrome. It is a syndrome. What happens? There is structural or functional impairment of the ventricular filling or else ejection. Ventricle gets filled up during diastole. If there is any abnormality in ventricular filling or ventricular ejection, it happens during ventricular systole. That means when ventricle ejects the blood into the aorta. Okay. So there should be structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection, which leads to the symptoms of dyspnea and fatigue. And signs of heart failure like peripheral pedal edema and pulmonary rails. Rails, also known as crepitation. So there will be fine crepitation and edema, which are the main sign of heart failure. So for the definition, complex syndrome happens due to structural or functional impairment of ventricular feeling or ejection of blood from the ventricle which ultimately leads to the cardinal symptoms of heart failure, that is dyspnea and fatigue and cardinal signs of heart failure, that is pedal edema, bilateral peripheral pedal edema and pulmonary crepitation or pulmonary rate. To talk about the epidemiology, uh, it is uh, said that almost 5 million of Americans, they do have congestive heart failure. If I talk about the global scenario, more than 26 million people are suffering from heart failure. Okay. Blacks, they do have an increased risk of heart failure. Okay. And the prevalence is greater in male in comparison to female in the age group of 40 to 70 years. But above 75 years, there is no sex predilection. That means it is as common as male in female. Okay. This is about the epidemiology of heart failure. One more thing I wanted to mention that almost 12% of the population that do uh, have heart failure, okay, if they belong to the age group of more than 80 years. The population are of more than 80 years of age. Among them, almost 12% of them, they tend to have 
heart failure. Coming to a very important thing that is types and physiology of heart failures. What are the types of heart failure? Previously, heart failure was subdivided into two types that is systolic and diastolic heart failure. Systolic and diastolic heart failure. But these days, this terminology again, it is not being used. Rather than these days, the terminologies or the types are heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. R for reduced. Reduced. R for reduced ejection fraction. Okay. When the ejection fraction of the left ventricle is 40 or below 40 percent, then it is known as heart failure with reduced ejection. And there is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. This stands for preserved. Okay. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Okay. When the ejection fraction is more than or equal to 50 percent, it is known as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now, there is something known as borderline ejection fraction heart failure. This is also known as heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. Heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction when the ejection fraction is between 40 to 50 percent. Below 40 or 40, it is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, 50 or above. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in between 40 to 50 percent, it is heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. There is one more entity which is important that is known as heart failure with recovered REC stands for recovered ejection fraction. There are many people who develop heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, this entity, but after treatment, their ejection fraction improves. They are known as heart failure with recovered ejection fraction. So, these are the subtypes of heart failure. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure with mildly reduced or borderline ejection. As I was talking about systolic and diastolic heart failure, though these terminologies are not very much in use these days, but just to have an idea that what happens in systolic heart failure? Systolic, as the name suggests, there must be something wrong during the systole. That means the ventricle is not able to eject the good amount of blood. Stroke volume is not very good when it happens, when the ventricles are stretched. This is the systolic heart failure, okay? Speech for systolic heart failure. Stretched ventricles, they are weak and they pump less amount of blood out of them to the aorta. Here, the uh, left ventricle is pumping blood to the, or this is the aorta, arch of aorta. Okay. So, like failure, there is effective ejection of blood from the ventricle. This is about diastolic failure. What happens in diastolic failure? This is about diastolic failure. What happens in diastolic failure? Diastole, in diastole there is usually filling of the ventricle. So, in diastolic failure there is defective filling of the ventricle. The ventricle cannot receive good amount of blood into them. Okay, so, thick and stiff ventricle fills with less blood than normal filling. Okay. This is just an idea about the systolic and diastolic heart failure. Coming to the important causes of heart failure that we must know not uh, that we just only treat the symptoms of heart failure, we need to treat the underlying cause of heart failure definitely. What are the causes of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? That is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. What are the causes? Coronary artery disease, okay? valvular heart disease, maybe aortic stenosis or regurgitation, mitral or tricuspid regurgitation. Congenital heart diseases, for example, intracardiac shunts, repair defects even, and systemic right ventricular failure. Infectious cause, Saga's disease and HIV may also lead to heart failure. Non-ischemic heart things, which, uh, 
toxic cardiomyopathy leading to heart failure. Chronic lung or pulmonary vascular disease, for example, core pulmonal and pulmonary arterial hypertension can also lead to heart failure. And certain autoimmune disease like giant cell myocarditis, lupus myocarditis, they may also heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now let's see the causes of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So hypertension is one of the important cause of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Then coronary artery disease may also lead to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Valvular heart disease like stenotic lesion of aortic and mitral valve. Restrictive cardiomyopathy, for example, in case of myelodosis, sarcoidosis, mochromatosis, these may also lead to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Other than that, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, constrictive pericarditis, myocarditis, the list is long. You need to remember most of the important causes of heart failures. Lastly, there is something known as high output heart failure, which happens basically due to hyperdynamic circulation, what we know as. What are the conditions where we get hyperdynamic circulation? For example, in case of thyrotoxicosis, anemia, AV shunt, liver cirrhosis, beriberi, that is vitamin B1 deficient. These are the causes of high output heart failure. So, in actual, these are the important causes. There are many causes of heart failure, but these are the important causes of heart failure which you can remember. Chat box, uh, someone has asked why there is edema. Good evening, everybody. Uh, chat box, someone has asked why there is uh, pedal edema. I am coming to it when I talk about the pathophysiology of when I talk about the pathophysiology of heart failure, I will tell you why there is pedal edema. Fine. So, coming to the functional a class of heart failure, what is very popularly known as NYHA, functional classification of heart failure. Now, what is NYHA? This is New York, New York Heart Association, functional classification. New York Heart Association, functional classification of heart failure. So. As per the functional classification, uh, divide the classes class 1 to 4. So let's see what is class 1. What is functional class 1 of NYHA? In functional class 1, there is no limitation of activity. There is no limitation of patient's activity. Ordinary physical activity does not cause in aid, dyspnea, chest pain or palpitation. These are all anginal equivalents. Angina, fatigue, dyspnea, palpitation. So ordinary physical activity, patient can do very well. There is no symptoms, no limitation of activity. Class 2, what happens? As someone progresses from class 1 to class 4, the severity increases. Class 2, what happens? There is slight limitation of physical activity. Patient is comfortable at rest, okay, but ordinary physical activity may result in fatigue, dyspnea, palpitation or angina. What happens in class 3? There is marked limitation of physical activity. Okay, Patient is comfortable at rest. It's important. Know that the patient is comfortable at rest. But less than day-to-day -day ordinary physical activity. Like for example, getting dressed or maybe eating leads to symptoms. Less than ordinary physical activity leads to symptoms. Age or class 3 where there is marked limitation of activity. Class 4, what happens? The last stage and that is the severe stage. Here is severe, find that the severe limitation of activity. Literally, patient cannot do anything. The patient is not comfortable even at rest. So, at rest also, patient has symptoms like angina, dyspnea, okay, chest pain, palpitation. So, symptoms of heart failure or angina are present even at rest and worsen with any activity. This NYHA classification very, very important from your exam point of view, from your practice point of view, or your competitive exam point. There are many times when questions is being asked about NYHA classification. So, 
I'll give you one example. Let's see whether uh, you can catch it or not. One example of an MCQ. It was asked in uh, AIMS, probably in 2013 or 14. it was asked. Like suppose someone has a marked limitation of physical activity. Marked limitation of activity. For any amount of activity causes dyspnea or angina palpitation. What will be the grade of NYH? Just now I have described. Is it 1, is it 2, is it 3 or is it 4? Mark limitation of physical activity. Is it grade 1, 3 or 4? This question was literally asked in AIMS exam. Let's see. What answer you give is give the answer, write down the answer in the chat box if you're following. Now, coming to the AHA or American Heart Association staging of heart failure, American College of Cardiology or American Heart Association staging of heart failure. There are again four stages of heart failure. Stage A. They are at high risk. Patient is at high risk of heart failure, but there is no symptoms of heart failure and there is no structural heart disease. Without structural heart disease or symptoms of heart failure, but the patient is at high risk of developing heart failure. Stage B, structural heart disease, but without signs or symptoms of heart failure. In this stage, they do have structural heart disease. There is no heart failure. In stage C, they do have symptoms of heart failure. They have structural heart disease plus symptoms of heart failure. D, there is refractory heart failure requiring specialized intervention. A, B, C, D. A, high risk of heart failure, structural heart disease. Stage B, there is structural heart disease but no sign and symptoms. Stage C, there is structural heart disease as well as there is symptoms, sign and symptoms of heart failure. Stage D, there is refractory heart failure localized in. Now, uh, just going back to the life check. Okay, some people has answered as stage 3, some has answered as stage 4. The previous question I am referring to uh, Sanyashi Pandit and Mansura Mosi. You have said it is stage 3. Yes, it is stage 3. There is marked limitation of physical activity. I have already shown in the previous slide. Let's, let's see again. If there is marked limitation of physical activity, it results in stage 3. It means patient is in stage 3 of NYHA. And if I would have mentioned that patient is uh, patient is uncomfortable even at rest, if I should have mentioned the word at rest, then it should be. Class 4. Thank you for following the class. I hope uh, you'll be benefited really if you follow the classes. Coming to the risk factors of heart failure. So, uh, hypertension is being considered as the commonest risk factor of heart failure. Coronary artery disease, advancing age, of course, as I have mentioned, more than 12% of the population of age more than 80 years they do have heart failure diabetes obesity high serum cholesterol level that means dyslipidemia valvular heart disease and hypervolemia these are the condition if the patient have this condition they'll be at high risk of development of heart failure we need to remember the risk factor because while we manage a case we need to take care of the risk factors of heart failure as well coming to the precipitating factors Heart failure, it has the uh, it has some precipitating factors, of course, which can be patient related, which can be provider related, okay, which can be due to some disease state of the patient. Patient related, why heart failure may be precipitated because of excess exertion or emotional stress. It is like same thing which precipitates coronary artery disease, as I have uh, discussed in my previous lectures. Excess fluid and or sodium intake, non-adherence to medication. Of course, if the patient is not compliant with the medication, there will be patient of heart failure. 
heavy alcohol use provider related if provider gives certain medications for the salt and water retention definitely there will be precipitate heart failure so for example nsaids calcium channel blockers they are negative inotropic agents okay so prescribed use of medications with negative inotropic properties may lead to precipitation of heart failure and inadequate use of diuretics these are provider related use of drugs for example nsaids which causes salt and water retention use of drugs which have phenotropic function like calcium channel blockers and inadequate or injudicious use of diuretics heart failure related if there is uncontrolled hypertension myocardial ischemia arrhythmias pulmonary embolism these may lead to precipitation of heart failure other systemic diseases for example any infection infection then liver cirrhosis then uh, hyperthyroidism untreated sleep apnea anemia these may also lead to precipitation of heart failure they are certain precipitating factors for heart failure coming to the pathophysiology of heart failure this is very very important and it is very interesting well what happens when the heart fails the heart fails there will be no uh, unloading of the baroreceptors heart fails cannot pump properly so volume also reduces so there will be unloading of the baroreceptors which are there in the aortic arch in the aortic arch the coronary coronary sinus and in the left ventricle wall okay so there will be unloading of the baroreceptors from the aortic arch coronary sinus left ventricle which will result in decreased parasympathetic function once there is decreased parasympathetic function there will be reduction in inhibitory signals in the brain so once there is reduction in the inhibitory signal in the brain from the vasomotor center there will be increased sympathetic activity and also there will be release increased release of vasopressin from the brain from the posterior pituitary there will be increased release of vasopressin as well as there will be increased sympathetic nervous system activity so what happens when there is increased sympathetic nervous system? there will be increased peripheral resistance that means there will be increased peripheral vasoconstriction leading to reduction in the limb blood flow because of increase in the peripheral resistance increased peripheral resistance because of increased sympathetic activity and there will be reduction in renal blood flow because of vasoconstriction taken over and there will be vasoconstriction leading to renal blood flow and wherever there is decreased renal blood flow there will be activation of RAS. RAS, you all know renin, angiotensin, aldosterone. So once there is activation of RAS, there will be increased release of renin. Increased release of renin, then renin will convert angiotensin to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 will be converted to angiotensin 2 with the help of angiotensin converted enzyme. Renin will act on angiotensinogen, form angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 will be converted to angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converted enzyme. Now, increase angiotensin 2 will lead to increased release of aldosterone. So, aldosterone releases. Uh, increase. So, what does uh, they do? Aldosterone, it, it really causes increased sodium and water reabsorption. There will be increased sodium and water reabsorption. Vasopressin also does the same thing. There will be increased reabsorption of water and sodium. So, what happens when there is increased, uh, you know, reabsorption of sodium and water? Ultimately, there will be a short term adaptation where the blood pressure will be maintained. This is actually what is happening. So, this neurohormonal activation it is helpful for short term adaptation, but for not, not for long term. Short term adaptation leads to maintenance of blood pressure by increasing the sodium and water reabsorption. 
but ultimately they causes damage this neurohormonal activation they ultimately cause damage to different organ system for example this angiotensin 2 it will ultimately lead to myocardial fibrosis myocardial cell death so ultimately there will be remodeling of the ventricles which is not at all a good thing so this is about the pathophysiology of heart failure i hope uh, this answers your uh, query as well as someone was asking in the live chat that what is the reason for peripheral edema so the reason for peripheral edema is increased absorption of sodium and water because of increased pathogenic activity leading to rash activation resaldosterone and then leading to sodium and water reabsorption Coming to the symptoms, what are the symptoms of heart failure? Okay, most common or cardinal symptoms. Okay, cardinal. Cardinal symptoms are fatigue and dyspnea. Patient may complain of orthopnea. Patient may complain of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. That is also known as ND. I'm sure what you know what is orthopnea. Orthopnea in uh, what does orthopnea mean? To know it, we can write it down in the live chat. Let's see who knows what is orthopnea. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. What is paroxysmal nocturnal? Actually, an episode which we need to describe. Once a patient of heart failure okay, goes into sleep, goes into bed, after one to two hours, patient awakens, patient awakens from the sleep with very much suffocation and breathing difficulty. Sometimes it may be associated with wheezing also. Breathing difficulty, suffocation, wheezing, and the patient will uh, sit up in the bed and patient will dangle the legs from the edge of the bed. And patient will remain in upright position for quite some time, which will help in leaving the breathing difficulty. It's an episode which happens. The patient goes for bed after one to two hours. This is paroxysmal nocturnal disease. Patient may also have cough. Cough is mainly because of interstitial edema, pulmonary edema. There will be cough. Exercise intolerance. Of course, when the heart fails, there will be exercise intolerance. Chain Stokes respiration. This is again very important in cases of heart failure. What is chain Stokes respiration? In chain Stokes respiration, there will be typically episode of hyperapnea and hypopnea. That means fast breathing and slow breathing. In between, there will be period of fall. There will be hyperventilation, fast breathing. Then there will be apnea and also there will be hypopnea. There will be slow breathing. So the breathing pattern becomes crescendo, decrescendo. Chain stroke, respiration, and cases of heart failure. Patient will also complain of anorexia, nausea, abdominal pain, and fullness. Why this thing? Abdominal pain, fullness. This is because of congestive hepatomegaly. In case of heart failure, we know that there will be congestive hepatomegaly, which will lead to abdominal pain. Abdomen and nausea. There will be confusion, difficulty in concentration, impairment of memory, headache, insomnia, and anxiety. Why so? Because of uh, you can say that there is if there is some amount of hypoxia in the brain, okay, less blood reaching in the brain, patient will have this all this type of complaints. Coming to the signs, very important. When you examine a patients, what are the things you should look for? We talk about general signs there will be diminished pulse pressure, hypotension, pulse pressure. If anyone knows about pulse pressure? What is pulse pressure? Please, you can write it down in the live chat. Let's see who knows about pulse pressure. I was asking about orthopnea. Orthopnea is difficulty in breathing, lying down position, and unlike PND, it happens. The patient lies down in supine position. Indy, as I said, it happens of course. Patient went for uh, patient goes for sleep, but orthopnea happens immediately after the patient lies down on bed. 
north of Nia can be, yes, someone has answered. Um, Kukulunga Dlamini, you have answered rightly. The rotognia is difficult in breathing when lying flat. So why uh, orthognia happens? It's very interesting. That's why I'm uh, telling happens because when someone lies down, the heart failure patient, they do have ascites, do have peripheral edema. So when patient like this lies down, then there will be no redistribution of the blood from the periphery to the chest the extra vascular fluid will come into the intravascular compartment they will go into the uh, lungs okay. ultimately lead to interstitial edema resulting in breathing difficulty so if you know about pulse pressure write it down cyanosis of lips and nail back Cold and pale extremities. If there is hypotension, have cold, clammy, pale extremities. Diaphoresis, increased sweating. On general physical examination, very important point: JVP, jugular venous pressure. So what happens? There will be raised JVP. It's a very, very, very important sign for heart failure, and it is very important from uh, the monitoring point of view. Also, when we treat a patient, we uh, really look at the JVP whether it is coming down or not. Well, then JVP should come down. There will be positive hepatojugular reflux. I am sure this thing is taught in your class. Uh, what is positive hepatojugular reflux? Once the JVP is raised, if you press over the abdomen, what will happen? A normal state, if you press over the abdomen, JVP will raise, but it will sustain it will come down but in pathological situation when you press over the abdomen may it be in the periumbilical region may it be in the right hypochondrium does not matter but when you press over the abdomen there will be raised jvp and it will be sustained the jvp will raise and it will be almost uh, sustained for more than 15 seconds so this is about the positive hepatojugular reflux Cardiac. On examination of uh, cardiovascular system, what you will get? The apical impulse will be displaced. It depends on the cause of heart failure. Depending on the cause, the apical impulse may be displaced. If there is left ventricular hypertrophy, apical impulse will be displaced somewhere. If there is right ventricular hypertrophy, it will be displaced somewhere. So, the cause is important. Left perasternal pulse, which is also known as heave. In a clinical topic, I will not go into detail, but he will be present if there is right ventricular hypertrophy. You may get S3 and S4. Usually, we don't get S3 and S4. It is very difficult to get, but in cases of heart failure, you may get S3 and S4. Murmurs of mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. If there is valvular disease, you will get murmur of the valvular disease. I was asking about pulse pressure a few minutes back. Someone rightly said pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic. So, the difference of SBP, systolic blood pressure, and diastolic blood pressure is the pulse pressure. So, this is a heart failure, the pulse pressure will go down. Because the systolic blood pressure will go down, if systolic blood pressure goes down, definitely the pulse pressure. What findings you'll get on examination of lungs? There'll be rails, pulmonary rails. Again, one of the very, very important sign of heart failure. Basal rails. We clinically we call it as bi basal rail. That means on auscultation of the lungs bilaterally in the basal area, you will get fine crepitations. These are known as pulmonary rails in cases of heart failure. Expiratory wheezing, which is also known as cardiac asthma. This is usually because of intestinal edema or pulmonary edema. Patient may have wheezing, very much breathing difficulty of wheezing, cardiac asthma. There may be pleural effusion also in case of heart failure on examination of lungs. Pleural effusion, mind it, in case of heart failure, the pleural effusion is bilateral. Most of the time, almost all the time, bilateral. 
So right side it is a little bit more than the left side. Remember that heart failure is one of the commonest cause of bilateral pleura. An examination of abdomen, what you will get? On examination of abdomen, you'll get ascites, you'll get congestive hepatomegaly, as I have already mentioned. Congestive spinomegaly, you may get jaundice. Okay, it's not on examination of abdomen, but come in general physical examination. Cardiac cachexia means the patient will lose uh, weight. What is the definition of cardiac cachexia? If the patient is losing more than 5% of the edema body weight over a period of 12 months or less. More than 5% of weight loss, edema free weight loss over a period of 12 months or less associated with maybe anorexia, fatigue, decreased muscle strength and some biochemical abnormal. It's about cardiac kicking. Fetal edema, I have already said what is the cause of fetal edema and heart pain. So uh, these are some interesting images where you can see there is bilateral pleural effusion. Bilateral pleural effusion and heart failure. How do we know there is pleural effusion? You cannot make out the which angles? You make out the costophrenic. So costophrenic angles you cannot make out. They are not very clear. So the patient is having bilateral pleural effusion. This is an example of raised JVP as you can okay raised jvp pitting piddle edema okay, it will always be pitting so pitting piddle edema and this is an example of hepatitis these all things you will heart failure if there is congestive symptom they're all congestive symptoms. raised jvp piddle edema hepatitis pleural effusion once you see a patient you will definitely remember this thing Coming to a very important topic that is Framingham's criteria. What is Framingham's criteria? Many time you will hear about this criteria. This is actually very important from competitive exam point of view because many times are asked based on this criteria. This criteria is actually derived from a study which is known as Framingham's Heart Study. 1971 from the data of the Framingham Heart study, this criteria has been derived. So it is divided into major and minor criteria. So let's see what are the major criteria. Among the major criteria, there will be in the paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. I have mentioned what it is, how it happens. Orthopnea, I have mentioned. Elevated JVP, I have mentioned. Pulmonary rails, already mentioned. Third heart sound S. Cardiomegaly on chest X ray. Pulmonary edema on chest x ray, diuresis more than 4.5 kg in 5 days. These are the major criteria. This thing you need to remember it. If you read for twice or thrice, you will definitely remember the criteria. The major criteria bilateral pedal edema, pitting pedal edema, nocturnal cough, dyspnea on ordinary exertion, photomegaly, pleural effusion. Cardia more than 120 beats per minute. Weight loss more than 4.5 kg in 5 days. Last 5 days. So these are the minor criteria. If you are going to say that the patient has heart failure, if there is presence of two major criteria or else one major and two minor criteria, we will know that the patient has heart failure. About the Framingham's criteria of heart failure. Now, Someone uh, asks you a question like, which is which is not a major criteria for heart failure? Which is not a major criteria of heart failure? Suppose the options given are. Number one, orthopnea. Number two, END. Number three, now on exertion. And number four, 
binary rings. If you can make out the answer, then please write it down in the live chat. We'll follow the answer. Which is not a major criteria for heart failure. Orthopnea, CND, non exertion or pulmonary ring. Read the question carefully and then you can write down the answer in the live chat. Coming to the differential diagnosis, I was telling it is a medical emergency, heart failure is a medical emergency. So, any other acute conditions, heart or lung conditions, they form differential diagnosis for heart failure. For example, myocardial infarction, a patient presented myocardial infarction, tension pneumothorax, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, asthma or COPD exacerbation, cardiac tamponade, ruptured viscous and valvular abnormality, mitral aortic syndrome. This forms the differential diagnosis for heart failure. Coming to the diagnosis of heart failure, how do you diagnose? Already we have discussed about the signs and symptoms heart failure, coming from criteria from which you can clinically diagnose a patient of heart failure. Now, how do you support your diagnosis with the help of investigation? There are many investigations you can do to support your diagnosis. You can do a chest x-ray, the findings, you can do an ECG, you can do an echocardiogram, you can do MRI for heart, cardiac MRI, you can do coronary NGO to find out the cause, you can do pulmonary artery catheterization or you can do Nuclear imaging also. Let's see what are the findings here in case of chest X. So in chest X ray, there will be cardiomegaly. There may or may not be cardiomegaly, but again, it is a common finding. So here is the chest X ray. You can see where the heart is cardiac sylhotic. So there is cardiomegaly. Curly's line A, curly's line or curly's line B. I'm going to Say in my next slide what is Curly's line. Pulmonary congestion. Pulmonary congestion forms of bat wing appearance or bat wing haziness. What is bat wing? Bat wing appearance means there will be prominence or the congestion of pulmonary vessel which spreads from the hilum to the periphery. Spread like bat wing. Okay. Here we have an image where the patient has pulmonary edema and if you can see there is haziness, bilateral haziness and as if like it has spread from hilum to the periphery. So, this is the bat wing appearance. This is the haziness it spread from hilum of the lung to the periphery like a bat wing. So, this is the bat wing appearance you get to see in cases of heart failure or pulmonary edema. Cephalization of veins, there will be congestion of the uh, pulmonary uh, veins in the upper zones. Okay, that is the cephalization of bilateral pleural effusion. I have already mentioned. Ask you the findings you get from x ray in case of heart failure. These will be your answers. Cardiomegaly, Carly's A or B line. There will be bat swing appearance. There will be cephalization of pulmonary vein, pleural effusion. These are the findings from. Now, what is Curly's line? So, if you can uh, notice, this there are two X-rays. Left hand side it is a normal X-ray, and the right hand, the right hand side we have of a heart failure. So, if you notice very carefully, you can there are some small lines, small small lines within the subdural region. Are less than one inch long, they run perpendicularly towards the pleura, usually uh, seen in the subpleural region base. Subpleural region at the base, small straight lines, these are the lines, small straight lines which are perpendicular to the pleura, they are known as Curly's B line. And they are very important from the diagnostic point of view for heart failure. They usually signify the interstitial edema and there is edema fluid in the cellular septa. Curly's B line. What is Curly's A line? Curly's A line, they are actually situated near the 
hilar region and they are usually longer than the Curly's B line. So Curly's B line is very much, uh, you know, uh, very much prominent or they are easily seen in cases of heart failure. Curly's A line is not so common. Coming to the ECG, what are the findings from ECG you may get? From ECG, you may get some idea about the cause of heart failure. There may be left atrial enlargement, signs of arrhythmias, hypertrophy of left or right ventricle and previous MI signs. For example, pathological Q wave. These are the findings from ECG which will help you to identify what is the cause of heart failure if it correlates with, with your clinical finding. Echocardiography, as I have said, which is again a very, very important diagnostic tool to find out the causes of heart failure. We can find out the uh, functional status of heart, like we can find out what is stroke volume, we can find out what is ejection fraction of the left ventricle, whether there is any diastolic dysfunction or systolic dysfunction. We can map the area of the uh, heart, map the volume of left ventricle, right ventricle, left atria, right atria, and we really know if there is any valvular heart disease, if there is any wall motion abnormality, as I have mentioned, of myocardial infarction, you'll get wall motion abnormality. MRI. You can do an MRI also, which is a gold standard for assessing cardiac mass or volume. Next, you can do exercise testing. So, exercise testing, this also I have mentioned in uh, my class of coronary artery disease. You can do a treadmill test to assess the function of heart and you can really assess the need for cardiac transplantation in cases of refractory heart failure. If a peak oxygen uptake is less than 14 ml per kg per minute, it is a poor progress. Coming to the biomarkers, again, very, very important diagnostic point of view or confirmation of the diagnosis. There are various biomarkers for heart failure or not. For example, we have BNP, brain natriuretic peptide, and NT pro BNP, N terminal, N terminal pro brain natriuretic. It is released from failing ventricles. So, if the BNP level is less than 100 picogram per deciliter or NT pro BNP less than 300, you that to know for sure that there is no heart failure, then we need to find out other causes. But if BNP is more than 500 and NT pro BNP more than 1000, you can be sure in 80% of the cases that you are dealing with a case of heart failure. So it is very sensitive when it goes up BNP more than 500, NT pro BNP more than 1000. The sensitivity is 80. When you are in doubt, you need to send this biomarkers for your diagnosis of heart failure. Now, many times there has been uh, questions has been asked on the cardiac biomarkers. I will just give an example. Let's see in the live chat what was the answer for the last question I asked. I was asking which is not a major criteria for heart failure. Some died as dyspnea on exertion. Very uh, true. Dyspnea on exertion, a minor criteria for heart failure. There is ortho pulmonary fails, all are major criteria for heart failure. Okay. Now I was talking about the biomarkers of heart failure question of on biomarkers of heart failure for example if you're asked which is not a cardiac biomarker which is not a cardiac biomarker option bnp proponent N terminal pro BNP. Okay. Let's see if you can answer. It is quite easy. If you know the answer, please write it down in the live chat.
So what is not a cardiac, which is not a cardiac biomarker? Is it BNP? Is it troponin and terminal pro-BNP or CEA? Others, as I said, you can do nuclear studies also like PET or PET. These are the studies you can do to find out the left ventricular function. Coronary artery catheterization you can do to find out different uh, chambers pressure if, uh, or ventricle pressure, pulmonary artery pressure, cardiac output. These things you can do from the pulmonary artery catheterization. Coronary NGO definitely you need to uh, want to find out if there is any ischemic cause for heart failure or not. Very coronary stenosis or not, this thing so from the coronary. Routine test, among the routine test, we do hemogram, electrolyte, creatinine, liver function, blood sugar, lipid profile, thyroid function test. These are basically done mainly to find out if there is any uh, uh, precipitating factors for heart failure or what are the causes of heart failure. So these tests are done on a routine basis. This is the protocol for evaluation of a patient of heart failure. Patient presenting with cardinal sign and symptoms of heart failure. You take a good history to a physical examination. Then you do a chest X-ray, echo, and other lab study. Echo will determine the cause. Echo uh, from echo you get the findings, and for determination of cause, you can depend on cardiac MRI, CT, or PET scan, coronary NGO, or you can screen for other diseases of which may have led to cardiac failure. For risk stratification, you can do NYHA classification clinically, as I have said, then stress testing, then cardiac biomarkers, ambulatory rhythm monitor, family history, mood and these are important for risk stratification. This is how you evaluate patient when you encounter a patient of heart failure. Coming to the uh, most important part or the last part, you can goals of treatment. What are the goals when you treat a patient of heart failure? To improve symptoms and quality of life, to decrease likelihood of disease progression, of course, to reduce the risk of death and need for hospital. These are our aims. We the symptoms, we need to improve the quality of life of the patient and we need to try to prevent the disease progression and need for hospital. Coming to the management, first let's talk about the non-pharmacological intervention. What are the non-pharmacological interventions we're going to advise to a patient with heart failure? Very importantly, diet. What type of diet you should be advising? Advice for a low salt, low fat, rich in fruits and vegetables, and high fiber containing diet. Water intake should be limited to 1.5 liters. They are already volume overloaded. They are already in a volume overloaded state, so we need to restrict the water intake to 1.5 liters. Smoking cessation, limit alcohol consumption, very important. Regular physical activity. Patient should be asked to supervise uh, exercise training for at least three minutes and at least five days in a week. Better if patient can do seven days in a week. This is about the non pharmacological diet. You take activity and you try to modify certain risk factors like try to stop uh, smoking by limit alcohol consumption. Now, coming to the treatment, okay, specific treatment for heart failure with preserved ejection. Uh, there is something known as general measures, okay. This is general, general what you do, and these are specific, specific measures what you do. In general, you need to uh, relieve the patient of the symptoms. So, you reduce the congestive state with the help of diuretic but don't give too much of diuretic which will even reduce the preload so judicious use of diuretic here to reduce the congestive state control the blood pressure maintain atrial contraction prevent any kind of arrhythmia which will gravitate or precipitate heart failure treat myocardial ischemia which may be the uh, single important factor or single important cause for heart failure Keep apnea and do lifestyle modifications. I have already talked about lifestyle. 
in general you use diuretic to reduce the congestive state of delicious use of diuretic then you control the risk factor to try to manage the comorbidity try to uh, treat the causes of heart failure to talk about a specific treatment of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in specific treatment we have ac inhibitors and endotensin receptor blockers arbs ac inhibitors and arbs they are important from prevention point of view aldosterone antagonists they are usually beneficial what aldosterone antagonists we have we have spironolactone we have aspirin digoxin not effective but it may reduce hospitalization digoxin does not give any mortality benefit so i will not go into the ineffective things beta blockers not very much effective effective if there is arrhythmias now there are certain novel therapies for example arni what is arni arni stands for angiotensin blocker neptrilysin inhibitor combination drug it is found to be effective for heart failure preserved ejection fraction just know the name arni angiotensin blocker with Heparin inhibitor, HGLT2 inhibitors. HGLT2 inhibitors, they are basic. Uh, you know, they are developed as an anti-diabetic agent, but they are found to be very much used in heart failure cases as well. These are the novel therapies. So, what drug are effective? If you are asked for aldosterone antagonist, effective. Arni effective. HGLT2 inhibitors effective. Others are not very effective as a specific, but if there are complications, you can use. For example, if there are arrhythmias, you need to use beta blockers. If the nootropic function is not good, you can use digoxin like that. Right? These are the treatments of heart failure for with preserved ejection. Important drugs I have talked about. Drugs for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. What are the drugs we can use? So AC inhibitors, AC inhibitors we can use like lisinopril, enalapril, captopril, trandolapril, ARB, tensin receptor blocker, losartan, valsartan, candisartan, aldosterone antagonist, aspirinone, spironolactone, beta blockers like metoprolol, carvedilol, bisoprolol. Vasodilators, arteriovenous dilator, hydralazine, isosorbide dinitrate comes in a combination, fixed dose combination can be used. And as I was saying, angiotensin receptor, naturalizing inhibitor, RD. Tecubitril and valsartan. Valsartan is an ARB, angiotensin receptor inhibitor or blocker. Tecubitril is naturalizing inhibitor. So, this fixed dose combination that is RNA can be used in case of both heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection. So, AC inhibitor, ARBs, aldosterone antagonist, the blockers, the vasodilators, and RNA. These are the of drugs used for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Coming to the last, coming uh, going back to the last questions which I have asked, I have asked about the cardiac biomarkers, which is not a cardiac biomarker. Someone has, has three. No, it is not three because in the previous slide only I have mentioned ProBNP is a very important cardiac biomarker. There's more than thousand, then you need heart failure. Answer should be four. That is CA. As the name only says, carcinogenic. It is a marker for cancers. It is a tumor marker. In case of uh, CA colon, CA rectum, CA lung, CA liver, this carcinogenic is positive. Whereas BNP, troponin, pro BNP, all are cardiac biomarkers. The answer should be 4. Someone has answered as 4. in the management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. There are certain other drugs also which can be used. They are not primary agent, but as a secondary agent they can be. For example, ibabradin. Ibabradin, it helps in reduction of heart rate. If the heart rate is more than 70 after the adequate of beta blockers. 
and the left ventricular ejection fraction should be 25 or less. So you use Evabridin. If LVEF, that is left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35 and heart rate more than 70 even after adequate beta blockade or if there is contraindication to beta blockade, you can use Evabridin helps in reduction in heart rate 2.5 to 5 milligram orally twice daily. I have talked about this drug when I have talked about angina. We use this drug in angina also and now in cases of heart failure. At the very beginning, I was telling acute decompensated heart failure, ADH. There are different presentations of acute decompensated heart failure. Someone may present with digestive symptoms like uh, no breathing difficulty, fatigue, then on examination you get fetal edema, raised JVP, hepatomegaly. Those cases you use diuretics if the patient is normal tense or you can use vasodilators also. If the patient has pulmonary edema, this is also one variety of acute decompensation heart failure. It means one presentation can be pulmonary edema. Those cases along with diuretics and vasodilators, you try to give oxygen and non-invasive ventilation. There is respiratory. Failure. Opiates can also be used. If the patient comes in a low output state, acute decompensated heart failure with reduced cardiac output, okay, which uh, may lead to hypotension and cardiogenic shock, those cases definitely you need to use inotropes to raise the blood pressure. Or you may use mechanical uh, support also, circulatory support also to raise the blood pressure. That's no go into so much of detail about this. So, inotrop, what inotropes we use if the patient comes with a uh, cardiogenic shock, cardiogenic shock, we use dobutamine, mildrenon, levosimendan and omecumtif macarbil. Names are quite, you know, like tongue twister, omecumtif macarbil. These are the drugs uses inotropes patient has cardiogenic shock what vasodilators we use nitroglycerin nesritide nitroprotide relaxin and gularitide these are the vasodilators which we use in acute decompensated heart failure in the diuretics we use loop diuretics nitrosamide and bumetan these are the drugs we use in cases of acute decompensated heart failure depending on the patient presentation. Now, let me ask you one question. There is no mortality benefit in case of heart failure. Which drug? Which drug does not give any mortality benefit. For one, the blocker. For two, AC inhibitors. Make it. Make it metoprolol inhibitor or alapril. Carvitolol and digoxin. What will be the answer? Which drug does not provide any mortality benefit to patient of heart failure? Is it metoprolol? Number one. Two. Is it AC inhibitor or enalapril? Three. Is it carvitolol or is it digoxin? For the answer, please uh, write it down in the live chat. I will. Later. Coming to digoxin, it is basically used if the patient has F and concomitant heart failure, LV dysfunction and atrial fibrillation. Otherwise, it does not have much of use for digoxin. Anticoagulation, it is used in atrial fibrillation and if there is in factor for cardioembolic stroke. These are the two conditions where anticoagulation is patients of heart failure, atrial fibrillation or cardioembolic stroke. Others, others, other drugs like omega-3 polyunsaturated acids have 
benefit does not have much of proven benefit but it is used omega 3 polyunsaturated fatty used micronutrient supplementation like thiamine and selenium is done for a patient of heart failure drugs which should not be used we should not only know the drugs which we use we may we really need to know the drugs which are not to be used so for example statin it does not provide any benefit if the patient does not have any ischemic pathology calcium channel blocker should not be used in cases of heart failure except emlodipine for example dimpiazem and verapamil they are not to be used because they directly suppress the myocardium so already failing heart will be more suppressed by calcium channel blockers like dimpiazem and verapamil nsaid is not to be used. i have said it causes this retention of salt and water isolidine dions for example pioglitazone they are in diabetic agent but again they are not to be used in patients of heart failure because thiazolidine dions also causes the sodium and water reabsorption precipitation of heart failure most of the antiarrhythmic drugs again should not be used and hormonal therapy also so these are the drugs are not to be used in patients of heart failure put these drugs also management of comorbidities definitely you need to manage the comorbidities as well along with the management of heart failure otherwise there will be always precipitation of heart failure so the last slide coming to the surgery and other procedures not improving with the medications as i have mentioned now then you call it as refractory heart failure what we do in case of refractory heart failure coronary artery bypass graft can be done depending on the cause we need to use the devices or we need to do surgery if there is a uh, coronary artery disease bypass graft may be done angioplasty may be done intra aortic balloon pump or intra aortic balloon counter pulsation and valve replacement valvular heart disease heart failure defibrillator implantation is known for arrhythmias like strat Arrhythmias like ventricular fibrillation, defibrillator implantation to be done. Cardiac transplantation probably remains only a definitive manifestation of heart failure. We cannot revert back a failing heart. As the time progresses, there will be worsening of heart failure. So, we can do a heart transplant that is probably definitive management of a case of heart failure. There is something known as LVAD, left ventricular assist. device just know the names with you just the names left ventricular assist device and crt known as cardiac resynchronization these are the surgical management do for a of heart failure so this was uh, all about heart failure i have this now going back to the last question asked that which drug does not give any mortality benefit for a patient of heart failure so the answer should be one has answered yes some answer oh, very very well done so chit has answered as digoxin very good it is digoxin only digoxin not give mortality benefit for heart failure reduce the rates of hospitalization but it does not provide any there is the drugs like misoprolol carvedilol then enalapril like ac inhibitors they do provide more benefit only indication for digoxin like as i said heart failure with atrial fibrillation so actually this ends uh, my lecture on heart failure if you have any query can write it down in the chat box i am here to answer your queries any queries if you have on heart failure write it down talked about heart failure in and i have talked about the causes of heart failure pathophysiology irritating factor signs symptoms how you diagnose a patient of heart failure and finally how do you manage what are the drugs you give for a patient of heart failure i'm sure the class will be really helpful to you so you can write it down in the chat box or the live chat the questions if you have any questions write it down next topic which i am going to discuss is acute asthmatic also a very 
very important topic good rheumatic fever very important as well as very interesting topic okay acute rheumatic fever what is it basically this acute rheumatic fever it comes under cardiovascular disease also as well as comes under connective tissue disease as well so it is a multi system disease it is not only a disease of cardiovascular system multi system disease and what happens this disease there is actually autoimmune reaction to infection caused by group a streptococcus there will be upper respiratory tract infection with group a streptococcus and there will be an autoimmune reaction to these infection which ultimately good rheumatic let's see the what is the epidemiology of acute rheumatic fever basically it is a disease of children the commonest affected age group is 5 to 14 it is disease of children of 5 to 14 years of it is rare in persons more than 30 years there is usually recurrent episodes of acute rheumatic fever it is common in adolescents and young adults the recurrent episodes are recurrent episodes much common in young adults and adolescents prevalence of heart disease it peaks between 25 to 40 years what is rheumatic heart disease rheumatic heart disease basically equally of acute rheumatic rheumatic fever there will be involvement of heart and this involvement recurrent involvement of heart by fever will ultimately rheumatic heart disease i am coming to this later on so the prevalence of rhd is uh, it, it peaks in between 25 to 40 years rheumatic fever 5 to 14 years age group is very important 5 to 14 years heart disease 25 to 40 years it is more common in females rheumatic heart disease is much more what is the pathogenesis of fever or rheumatic heart disease per se there will be exposure to group a streptococcus will be upper respiratory tract infection by group a streptococcus okay which is known as acute rheumatic fever okay. it will be followed by acute rheumatic upper respiratory tract infection followed by acute there is not immune response of the body there will be recurrent acute rheumatic fever in high risk population for at high risk they will have recurrent acute rheumatic fever and the recurrent acute rheumatic fever or involvement of the heart will ultimately lead to rheumatic heart disease and this rheumatic heart disease may progress to heart failure or it may stroke or endocrine and the ultimate result is patient may require a surgery or the patient may become disabled or it is sexual actually the pathogenic pathway or as we this is actually the natural history of the disease every disease has a natural how it starts how it progresses this is actually the natural history of acute rheumatic fever or rheumatic heart disease organism factor or host factor we discuss what is organism factor there are certain typical serotypes which usually leads to rheumatic fever. if suppose someone has infection with the typical m serotypes like 1 b 5 so you need to remember these serotypes because it is important for mcq we ask which is not a uh, acute rheumatic fever causing serotype or which is acute rheumatic fever causing serotype of group a streptococcus One, three, five, six, fourteen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty-four, twenty-seven, and twenty-nine are associated with acute rheumatic. That is my acute host factor. For host, HLA class two alleles, they are, uh, you know, they are associated with increased susceptibility of acute rheumatic fever, like HLA DR seven and HLA DR four. They are associated with increased susceptibility, whereas Actually, DR five, six, DR fifty one, DR fifty two, and actually DQ they are associated with or related with the protection from acute. 
this is very important from your competitive or MCQ point of view. Try to uh, you know remember the organism factor, the MCQ types, and cost factor. Right, which active and which increases the susceptibility to develop symptoms of acute rheumatism. What actually happens in acute rheumatism? As I was saying, happen uh, following acute, uh, oh, acute respiratory tract infection. What happens when there is infection by the typical serotypes and of group A streptococcus? There will be some you know, uh, antigenic cross reaction. Immune response targeted the streptococcal antigen and it also recognizes the human tissue. There will be formation of antibodies against the streptococcal antigens. Because of the cross reactivity, of the antigen with the uh, certain antigens of different body tissue, antibodies which our body produces against the organism, they will not only function against the organism, they will also, uh, you know, cause uh, uh, they will form antigen antibody complex against our own body tissue. That is known as molecular mimicry or antigen recovery. This is the main. Underlying pathophysiology of good rheumatic, that is molecular mimicry. Coming to the clinical features, there will be a latent period of almost three weeks, average three weeks or one to five weeks. Someone, if uh, someone has a respiratory tract infection by the typical organism, then acute rheumatic will follow after one to five weeks of the respiratory tract infection. We take a history, we need to really ask if there was a Reading history of uh, sore throat or pharyngitis. Carditis is a very, very important criteria, or you can say, uh, you know, clinical manifestation. Carditis is usually in the form of pancarditis, called the myocardium, endocardium, and pericardium. So there will be pancarditis. Now, because of the involvement of the myocardium, there will be involvement of Valves as well. So, commonest valve involved is mitral. In rheumatic carditis, the commonest valve involved is mitral, and the commonest lesion is mitral regurgitation. The acute stage, there will be mitral regurgitation. But when the patient develops rheumatic heart disease, there will be mitral stage. Acute state of the disease, acute rheumatic heart disease, there will be mitral regurgitation. And in cases of rheumatic heart disease, after having recurrent infection, it will be rheumatic heart disease and of mitral stroke, the commonest lesion with rheumatic heart disease. The isolated involvement of mitral valve is common. Sometimes mitral valve is involved along with aortic valve. But the involvement of tricuspid and pulmonary valves are very rare with rheumatic carditis. Sometimes there may be involvement of the conductive tissue as well. If there is involvement of the conductive, then there will be PR prolongation, which is a sign of sign of first degree AV block or first degree heart block. It's about carditis. Now coming to polyarthritis. Polyarthritis means there will be involvement of one joint, usually. The large joints are involved. Large joints like the knee, ekhon ek ekhon dik rafai. Hello, are you okay? Are sound?
so there will be polyarthritis which is typically known as migratory polyarthritis migratory what do you mean by migratory migratory means there will be involvement of one joint which will be followed by involvement of other joint over a period of hours means the pain will not remain localized in a single joint there will be pain and sequential involvement of other joint also suppose the pain happens in the right knee after a few hours it will be in the left ankle like that okay migratory or fleeting joint pain and usually larger joints are involved for example knee ankle hip elbow these are the pain joints involved of polyarthritis and acute rheumatic fever chorea chorea it is also known as sydenham sydenham's chorea sydenham's chorea it usually involves the upper limb and the head and they it will involve the tongue also there will be something known as darting movement of the tongue chorea is something which usually comes late it becomes after six months of presentation also when all the other things disappears the patient on chorea usually very much common in female so when a female patient presents with the typical sydenham scoria we can really diagnose of rheumatic fever erythema marginatum what is erythema marginatum erythema marginatum is a dermatological manifestation there will be pink macules there will be pink macules over the trunk usually over the trunk never on face it does not appear in the face usually trunk and limbs it will appear it's like pink macule and there will be central clearing it will be cleared it will be a pink macule there will be a you know serpiginous snake like tortuous border erythema marginatum subcutaneous nodule there will be presence of painless nodule of okay? less nodule and they are usually of the size of 0.5 to 2 cm they underlie the just beneath the skin over the bony prominence you need to examine the bony prominences where you will find small small mobile painless nodules they are subcutaneous nodules they are usually typically found over the hand elbow of the foot near the vertebras so these are the areas bony areas you need to look for find the subcutaneous fever is also important area or important these are the important clinical manifestation of uterine coming to the investigations what are the investigations you need to do some investigation you need to always consider like ecg o cbc complete blood count c reactive protein streptopathology like anti streptolysin that is known as aso aso titer anti dnasb also known as adb relevant situation these are the things you need to do for everybody and in certain situations you need to do a throat swabs throat swab blood culture synovial fluid analysis when there is arthritis okay then other routine examinations also you need to these just remember these are the important to to diagnose a case of acute rheum now i was talking about echocardiogram echocardiogram is a very important diagnostic tool for rheumatic fever and there are echocardiographic criteria for diagnosis of uh, rheumatic heart disease or acute rheumatism i will not go into the detail of echocardiographic uh, uh, criteria for the diagnosis you can just uh, read the books and go through it but there is a uh, view you can see we call it as a parasternal long axis view no need uh, to know at your level but just know that this is the anterior mitral leaflet okay this is the one this is the left atria this is the left ventricle and we know that in between left atria and left ventricle there remains the mitral valve so this is the anterior leaflet of mitral valve and this is the posterior leaflet of mitral valve if you look at the anterior leaflet look at the 
anterior leaflet very carefully you can see that the leaflet is thickened okay it is thickened other than thickening there is doming that there is doming towards the interventricular septum this is interventricular septum right ventricle left ventricle in between right and left there remains the interventricular septum so there is doming of the anterior mitral leaflet there is thickening of the anterior mitral leaflet and there is restriction of movement here otherwise you have gone like this there is restriction of movement which is typically known as hockey stick appearance of anterior mitral leaflet hockey stick just remember this this is the hockey stick appearance of mitral anterior mitral leaflet and that is kind of diagnostic for rheumatic heart disease coming to the very important uh, uh, topic that is the diagnosis of acute rheumatic disease how do you diagnose a case of acute rheumatic it is by jones criteria or modified modified jones criteria so there will be major criteria and minor criteria plus there should be evidence of recent streptococcal infection what are the evidence of recent streptococcal infection we can do aso titer i have mentioned do mp dna b titer we can do a throat swab culture these are the things to find out you can do to find out if there is evidence of streptococcal infection okay and antigens also rapid antigen test also you can do rapid antigen test also so if there is evidence of recent streptococcal infection plus two major manifestation or one major two minor then know that this is due to rheumatic fever initial the first episode of rheumatic fever or if there is two major or one major and two minor or three minor may be case of recurrent acute rheumatic fever okay, right so major and minor manifestation plus there should be evidence of recent streptococcal infection with the help of this test you can what are the major criteria major criteria and minor criteria again they can be divided into low risk and high risk group. For low risk population, carditis is a major criteria, maybe clinical or subclinical. For moderate to high risk, also it is a major criteria. Arthritis is a major criteria, polyarthritis only. But for high risk, it can be monoarthritis, it can be arthralgia, even polyarthralgia. Podia, erythema marginatum, subcutaneous nodules, pain. So these are the five major criteria. One, carditis, two, arthritis. Area, four erythema marginatum, five subcutaneous. Coming to the minor criteria, the low risk population polyarthralgia is a minor criteria, but moderate to high risk monoarthralgia is also a minor criteria. Fever, same more than 38.5, ESR more than 60 or equal to 60, CRP more than equal to 3. For moderate to high risk, ESR even 30 or more is also considered as a minor criteria. Other than that, prolonged PR interval is again a minor criteria for both the groups. So, if two major criteria are present, one major or two minor criteria, or only three minor criteria are present, along with the evidence of recent streptococcal infection, you know that this is a case of acute rheum. This is about the diagnosis of acute rheum. Coming to the last part, that is the treatment, the most important part. How do you treat a case of acute rheumatic fever? This is treatment, and then I'm going to come to the prophylaxis prevention. Penicillin is the drug of choice for treatment of acute rheumatic fever. You can use orally or you can use intramuscular. Orally, you can use penicillin, noxymethyl penicillin, 500 milligram twice daily, or if it is a children, it is a child weighing less than 27 kg, then you half the dose there, milligram twice day. Or you can give a single dose of single intramuscular dose of benzathin penicillin, 1.2 million unit, if okay, usually, or if the weight of the child is less than 27, then you give half of the dose there. That is, uh, uh, sorry, it's lacks. Amoxicillin is a second choice if someone has allergy to 
then dimoxyphen can be used 50 mg per kg you can use for it ten, uh, for 10 days for others like for symptomatic relief you use salicylates and antihistamines aspirin is a drug of choice for arthritis and arthralgia fever just to mention that if you are suspecting it to be a case of rheumatic fever patient has arthritis and patient is responding to aspirin then you need to revise your diagnosis it is kind of a dictum that if a patient of rheumatic arthritis is there he or she will definitely respond no response then you think otherwise the dose of aspirin is 50 to 60 mg per kg maximum up to 100 mg per kg can also be given per day then you reduce the dose after 2 weeks okay you reduce to 50 to 60 mg per day for a further 2 to 4 days if aspirin is not tolerated or the patient has allergy to aspirin then you can use naproxen as an alternative if the patient has congestive heart failure patient develops heart failure because of rheumatic fever then you need to use steroid though it is controversial may but you may need to use steroid and definitely you need to manage the case of heart failure take in a class on heart failure so you can go through it you see how to manage a case so treatment of rheumatic acute rheumatic fever you give antibiotic targeted against the streptococcus penicillin remox Then you give symptomatic relief of arthritis, fever by using uh, aspirin or naproxen, and then you need to manage the heart failure, steroid like glucocorticoid and heart failure per se. Other than that, rest is very important. The patient will be in pain because of arthritis and all, so rest is important. But you need to uh, mobilize the patient, or ambulation is to be done as soon. it is possible and as tolerated how to manage chorea chorea is kind of very difficult to manage carbamazepine or soda valproate sodium valproate is preferred in the over haloperidol sometimes you may need to give prednisolone of 0.0 chorea you use carbamazepine or sodium valproate sometimes you may need to give prednisolone there has been questions the management of chorea also in sicky sometimes you may need to use ivig also if the chorea is ivig stands for intra venous immunoglobulin so intra venous immunoglobulin you use if we, if the chorea is refractory to all other treatments lastly follow up how do you follow up a patient inflammatory markers should be monitored every one to two that is pr psr these to be monitored until they have normalized an echo should be performed after one month and you see what is the status lastly prevention you need to give primary prophylaxis patient with streptococcal infection and if the patient has already developed a uh, rheumatic arthritis you need to do secondary prophylaxis for primary prophylaxis we started within 9 days of the time period is important within 9 days you need to give treatment for primary you need to give uh, medications for primary prophylaxis the drug of choice is penicillin and for secondary prophylaxis you need to use benzathione penicillin orally you can use oral penicillin v and patient not tolerating penicillin you need to give erythromycin so these are the three drugs we use for secondary prophylaxis benzathione penicillin g it is given as from muscular injection once in every 4 weeks one injection every 4 weeks oral penicillin twice daily 250 mg twice daily or else if the patient is allergic as i said you use erythromycin 250 mg twice the last slide what should be the duration of secondary prophylaxis give secondary prophylaxis there may be three scenarios the patient may have only acute rheumatic fever but no carditis that case what you do you give secondary prophylaxis for 5 years after the last attack or 21 years of patient's age which ever is longer rheumatic fever with carditis but no residual valvular disease patient has rheumatic fever patient has carditis but there is no residual valvular in that case you lengthen the prophylaxis for 10 years after the last attack 
or 21 years of age, whichever is longer. Last situation when the patient has residual or persistent valvular involvement. The patient has persistent valvular disease. In that case, what do you do? You give prophylaxis for 10 years after the last attack or 40 years of age. Sometimes some authority, they do prefer to give the secondary prophylaxis for lifelong also in this scenario where the patient has developed residual or persistent valvular disease. So these are the three scenarios. Rheumatic fever without carditis, ten year, 5 years after the last attack or 21 years of age, longer. Rheumatic fever with carditis but no residual valvular disease. You lengthen 10 years after the last attack or 21 years of age, which is longer. But scenario, rheumatic fever with residual or persistent valvular disease, you may give it for lifelong also. Is up to 40 years of age or 10 years of last attack, which is good. So, this sums up all about the good rheumatic fever and rheumatic. I hope you have followed the class for sure and it is helpful for you. Uh, all the best, and let's see you in the next class. And now, if you have any query, you can really ask me live chat and I'm here to answer your queries. you have uh, queries you can ask now or you can ask in the comment section of later on this suggestion or anything if you comment on the uh, you can really comment later on also but now if you have any query you can ask me you have to answer all your queries If there is no more query, then uh, we shall stop here. We'll be live soon again. Thank you so much for your patience hearing. It was really nice that we had a real good interaction.